It's really not that complicated. I got red in my ledger. I'd like to wipe it out. Can you? Can you wipe out that much red? Drakov's daughter? Sao Paulo? The hospital fire? Barton told me everything. Your ledger is dripping. It's gushing red, and you think saving a man no more virtuous than yourself will change anything? This is the basest sentimentality. This is a child of prayer. Pathetic! You lie and kill in the service of liars and killers. You pretend to be separate, to have your own code. Something that makes up for the horrors. But they are part of you. And they will never go away. I won't touch Barton. Not until I make him kill you. Slowly. Intimately. In every way he knows you fear. And then he'll wake just long enough to see his good work. And when he screams, I'll split his skull. This is my bargain, you mewling quim. You're a monster. <laughs> oh no. You brought the monster. So, Banner. That's your play. What? Loki means to unleash the Hulk. Keep Banner in the lab. I'm on my way. Send Thor as well. Thank you for your cooperation. So, there we are. Uh, classic, of course, at least a new classic. That's uh, the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And we get to see my favorite character, Black Widow. Black Widow faces... A... Uh, sorry about that. As always, technical problems. So, um, Black Widow, Natasha. She's always something seems like a bit of a joke. I mean, she's surrounded by the Hulk and Captain America and uh, all the other heroes of the Avengers. And what's her superpower? Uh, it's not clear at all. She doesn't really have one. She shoots really well, but that's about it. And yet, somehow she always remains pivotal to the MC, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's, uh, she's absolutely essential to many storylines. And she does that because eh, she's a little manipulative. She's a little uh, uh, good. There's also a fantastic interrogation scene earlier where she gets what she needs to know out of uh, someone who thinks he's interrogating her. So anyway, uh, I think it's a reasonably decent setup to meet uh, our matriarch, Rebecca, or Rivka. So, uh, last time I recorded for this uh, Parsha, I talked about Esau and how Esau may be getting um, a bit of a, a, a bad rep from rabbinic tradition, and there are certain aspects of our ancestor uh, Esau that we need to recover. Well, I want to talk about Rebecca. So, uh, Rebecca also finds herself being second or being uh, the follow-up. Uh, doesn't seem so important, right? She's, um, uh, she's second to Isaac, who has the blessing. She doesn't have the blessing. She's marrying into the blessing. Uh, she's second to Sarah, and Sarah is absolutely critical. We learn late in the Sarah and Abraham saga, that uh, she is actually essential. Uh, God tells Abraham earlier, a few chapters earlier, that while Ishmael is great and uh, God is going to show favor towards Ishmael, uh, it's God's plan that uh, the blessing should pass through Sarah. So, as much as we focus on Abraham, it turns out Sarah is absolutely essential to God's plan. So um, she's second to that. And uh, it's also the case that uh, while Abraham and Sarah were groundbreakers, uh, Rebecca marries into a task 
that has been inherited. And we even see that in our Torah portion, told dope, by uh, uh, Isaac reportedly going around and restoring all the wells that Abraham had established. He's not a, he's not a trailblazer, and apparently neither is she. And of course, as we understand, uh, probably more in this age than in any other, uh, she's second as a woman. We recognize the um, patriarchal, truly patriarchal nature of the narrative in Genesis and how women are really second in all cases. However, I would like to make the case that Rebecca is perhaps the greatest of the matriarchs, greater than Sarah, greater than Rachel, who gets so much attention for uh, being so deeply loved by Jacob, uh, greater than Leah, who produces the majority of the Israelite clans flow through her womb. So what is it about Rebecca? Well, Rebecca starts out, uh, remember, we just get these little snapshots from different ages in the uh, narrative. She starts out, of course, being a very young girl um, who uh, provides assistance to Abraham's servant, Eliezer, and she demonstrates certain qualities, even as young as she is. She's a woman of action, less than words. She's generous and she's strong and pretty fearless because this is a young girl encountering a stranger with all these camels in a caravan and she just walks right up and offers to give him water and give water to the, the, his animals. So she's uh, uh, pretty exceptional already just in a few gestures and then uh, when Eliezer comes to her family to ask whether uh, she might consider going to an unknown far-off location to marry a man she's never met, well, she seems to have a sense of destiny. She is adventuresome, and she's a risk-taker. So off she goes with Eliezer uh, to marry Isaac. Now, the next snapshot we get out of her life is the time when she's pregnant and she has twins. And it proves to be uh, quite difficult, an endurance test, and she struggles uh, to endure this, but she comes to an understanding. God actually speaks to her, uh, and that is unique. Uh, none of the other matriarchs had God speak directly to them. Now, Sarah did have an angel uh, reprimand her uh, about laughing. But other than that, God doesn't speak to the matriarchs, but God does speak to uh, Rebecca and tells her what's going on, that there are two nations in her womb that will be in conflict with each other, and one will dominate the other. So, uh, not a lot of clarity, but there it is. Uh, she embraced destiny, and destiny is now within her. And then we come to the final element in our Torah portion, which is that uh, the two brothers are at odds. Only one of them apparently can inherit the blessing that God has given uh, to Abraham and pass it on. And she makes the decision who it should be. Remember, that God didn't say which of the two uh, brothers would dominate the other, but she decides for everyone, for Isaac, uh, for um, Jacob, for Esau, maybe even for God, who it's going to be. And she chooses uh, Jacob, even though Isaac favors uh, Esau, you know, Esau's... Uh, provides for his, uh, his uh, baser needs by providing him with food, etc., etc. And so she actually arranges and manipulates the situation in order to get the outcome that she believes should happen. Now, from our perspective, uh, this kind of manipulative uh, doing things behind the scenes uh, is uncomfortable. However, I, I think in context of the story, the time, the place, we have to understand two things. One, 
It's an extraordinarily patriarchal society. Only Isaac has the power to decide this. And if he puts his foot down, and maybe he already has, and says, oh, no, the blessing's going to Esau. Well, what is she to do about it when she knows that's not the right choice? So uh, what she does is she plays behind the scenes, uh, using an opportunity that comes along to achieve that. Uh, just as important, she does what women in traditional cultures uh, have done all the time. They're, if they're the power behind the throne, they figure out the methods uh, to extract the results they want, like Black Widow. Right. And uh, but this one is uh, pretty extraordinary. Of course, this is the point where uh, Isaac, who is now blind and elderly, decides to tell his son Esau that he's going to give him his blessing. But first, Esau has to hunt up a meal for him. And over this feast, the blessing will be given. So learning this, Rebecca tells uh, Jacob while her uh, while her eldest son is away. Uh, that Jacob should uh, garb himself in um, goat skins on his arms, so that uh, when Jacob the blind, when the blind uh, Isaac touches him, uh, he'll be uh, convinced that it's actually his hairy brother. And uh, so then it becomes a kind of subtle. The language of the Torah is kind of subtle. He comes in. He says that he is Esau, he's returned, uh, they've taken uh, a goat and they've made a meal out of it uh, and presented it to him. And is Isaac really fooled? He actually says, uh, the hands of the hands of Esau, but the voice is the voice of Jacob. Maybe, just maybe, finally, in this moment, he concedes that Rebecca is right, that Jacob is the one who uh, should receive the blessing. And so he blesses him and uh, sets Jacob on the course, the younger brother, uh, to uh, be the carrier of the blessing forward into the story from this point on. Of course, it sets up even more conflict for the brothers. Esau returns, discovered uh, that there's been a manipulation and becomes enraged. And uh, Jacob has to flee to find his destiny elsewhere. But what we need to appreciate is that uh, Rebecca put this all into motion. Uh, she sets the course for the future of the Israelite people and therefore for the Jewish people. How many Jewish women in the hundred generations since Rebecca have, despite not having a great deal of formal power, been able to shape the course of Jewish history? So now that uh, you don't have to pretend anymore, uh, now that women can come out front like uh, Black Widow, even if she doesn't have all the superpowers that we presume everybody else does, uh, we should listen to the wisdom of women and appreciate what they're offering us in terms of guiding the Jewish people for the next generation. So with that, I'm uh, done with my uh, Taste of Torah today. That was uh, Parshat Toldot, and we'll see you next week.